And uh, without further ado, here's Simon. Thanks. Brilliant, folks. So good to be with you. Uh, welcome to the guys again on the live stream or if you're on Catch Up. And uh, I think I was last year, probably here three or four years ago. I think it's my, my fifth time over the years being here. It's always a pleasure. I love what you guys do in the city. I love the influence you have in so many different spheres. And I hope in, in terms of being here with you again this evening, it'll just stir up more faith, more passion, more zeal. I suppose my DNA is, um, if this is true, then it's worth everything. And if it's not true, we're wasting our time. And so that would be uh, what, in a sense, the logic that took me to what was the most dangerous country in the world, where I expected to die, where people tried to kill me, uh, and I'm still alive. And, and it's funny, because last week you were looking at boring, and, uh, you know, Christianity is not boring. I mean, we, we can make it dull, and the institution uh, might have issues, and... Uh, yeah, but Jesus, I mean, Jesus, he said, if you come after me, uh, you'll have life and life to the full. That's what, he, that's what I've come for, you know, have life and life to the full. That'd be one of my favorite verses, John 10, 10. So we're looking at a series of uh, boring, irrelevant, hypocritical. You had boring last week. Now we're looking at irrelevant. And so if you wanted to title the talk, I'm, talk, I'm talking about uh, relevance, and I'm going to call it, subtitle it, the, the cost of compassion. And as we kick off on that, uh, and normally I would exposit a text and work through it, but it's a bit different this evening. I'm just going to take a springboard from a text. But um, as context, I'm going to show you a few pictures. So hopefully they'll be coming up on the screen right now. Now, whether you, you follow Jesus for ages or whether you are checking things out uh, as a newbie right now, all of you will be, will be challenged by some of these stories. Okay? I think part of our job, my job, is to challenge our worldviews even uh, because we think how we see reality is reality. So, uh, And we've all got... A, a take on reality and there are cultural strengths and weaknesses in every culture and it's finding the good and holding on to the good whilst rejecting the bad and, and having the humility to recognize that we what we see is not exactly how reality is i hope you agree with me on that anyway look at these pictures so that's burundi up there and um next one so i lived and worked out of bujumbra 20 years there now based in bath because of kids education but i was out there 10, 12 days ago and that's the language amen next one uh, that's our charity. I'm not here to talk about charity. Next one, but that's it. What, what we do is we transform Burundi and beyond. The beyond would be a few books I've written, talks like this, that hopefully stir faith. Um, that, those books, so if you look at that last one, yeah, how far is too far? Last one, uh, more than conquerors. How far is too far when God went that far? And then uh, that is uh, choose life. That's a daily devotional. So, you know, some choices we make don't matter. It doesn't matter what you had on your toast at breakfast. It does matter whether you choose faith or fear. It doesn't matter whether you choose cynicism or action. It doesn't matter whether you choose urgency or apathy. So if you want a daily shot in the arm, if you resonate with this evening, come and see me afterwards and grab one of those books. Next one. That's our family. Uh, in lockdown, we had a different sort of theme night. What was that? That was uh, Star Wars? No. Um, anyway, uh, I, I ne I, I'm sure pretty much last time I was here, I told this story. But I never get tired of telling it, and there's a twist to it. But my daughter there, apart from having a few facial hair issues, she is named after next one. She's named after that girl. And that girl started life down the toilet. So she was given birth to and thrown away down the toilet. And the next person going to, that, to the toilet, University Hospital, um, sorry, do you wanna go back to the last one? Yeah, so um, the, the next person going to the toilet uh, saw this piece of flesh down there and she reached down, she pulled her out. She, she was still alive. And she weighed just a couple of pounds. She was fed through a straw like a little bird. And the person that cleaned her off got poo on themselves in the process. And next picture is her 18 years later. So you look at that. That is the same girl. And next one, she ends up being our babysitter uh, as God wove the tapestry of our lives. And what's interesting is that my, my friend who adopted her gave her the most beautiful name. And when I married Lizzie, my wife, I said, if we are ever blessed with a daughter, I want to name her after that girl. So a little white one is named after a big black one there. They share the same name. The name is Grace. And I love that name because that's the gospel. If you're, if you're unfamiliar, this 30-second bit will be the most important thing. If you're checking out Jesus this evening, this is the most important bit. It's, it's not about religion. It's, it's, it, there's the picture of grace, that girl starting life down the toilet. That is a picture of what Jesus did for us. Whether we're multi-murdering rapists, pillaging idiots in Central Africa, or very self-absorbed people here in Bristol, we all need God's grace. And religion is thinking that you could possibly get out of that pit by yourself. No, you're separated from God. You know that. You've messed up. You screwed up. And perfection cannot be mixed with imperfection. But Jesus solves that issue. God, with fle God in flesh. So that's what the incarnation, that theological term means. Jesus comes down and he bridges that gap and he picks us up. 
And he, he cleans us off on the cross and takes all up on him so that we can be clean and pure and beautiful. And he can look at you this evening and say, Mwah, I love you. That's my girl. That's my boy. That's grace. That is amazing grace. And the next picture after that one shows her, you know, from the pit of a toilet, we got her scholarship to America. She got a distinction in her degree. And next one, she comes back and ends up working for us in social media. And next one, the latest part of her journey is that in January, she started off doing her master's in, in counseling in, uh, in Newcastle. Wasn't that beautiful? From the pit of the toilet, God is the God of the impossible. And I want to fill you with fresh hope this evening because some of you are going through a hell of a time. And you're, you're despairing or, or you, you, yeah, you're just not very hopeful. You've had some sucker punches. There is always hope. I'm not going to give you a soft sell, but there is always hope. Next one. So we're the hungriest country in the, in the world. We're the, we're the poorest country in the world, according to the World Bank. Uh, you, we can't stand hunger, really, I think, in this country in terms of a statistic, 56% malnourishment in Burundi. I can't get my head around that, but I can get my head around this picture, which sort of encapsulates it, because my, four -year -old, my friend's four-year-old Canadian daughter there, she's four in that picture, Alma. She's four. The girl in the middle, she's four. Or she was four. And she's probably dead now. Or if she's not dead, then she's got stunted brain development. And I don't, how does that make you feel? That makes me angry and that makes me weep. I think both of those emotions are God's heartbeat. And uh, that's just wrong. That's wrong. And part of this evening's challenge to all of us is to pick a fight. There are lots of fights worth picking. And for me, my call has been to Burundi. Uh, no one else has called probably this year. Paul's been very engaged in Burundi. But, you know, the agenda is not to get a new recruiting drive to Burundi. It's to seek God's face because he has got something that he wants all of us to be involved in. And you are made uniquely different. And he wants to lay hold of you and use you for his purposes from this evening if you haven't yet surrendered to him. Next one. So, you know, we've done this for years and sent out uh, evangelists into the bush to cast out demons and heal the sick and get beaten up and get put in prison. And we've done it 16 years. Do the math on this. An average of 700 people for two, month, for two weeks in August. So it's coming up again. 14 days times uh, 700 people times 16 years times eight hours a day. That's a lot of serious intentional outreach. They've cast, I mean, they've seen every sort of Acts of the Apostle type miracle, a modern day version. And we reckon we've seen 170,000 people come to Jesus in that time. Mind blowing. Next one. Just one of those stories would be a witch doctor there. You know, our guy showed up in the village and uh, he started doing his juju stuff. And one of them said, we zina ya yesu. And he was slain he, by the power of God. Came on him. He was flattened. He came to a few minutes later. said, could come back in two days? Two days later, he'd assembled the whole village. And the preaching of the gospel and him burning his chance publicly as the senior spiritual authority, submitting to the highest power. He, 50 people in that village, gave their lives to Christ. Love it. That's our Jesus. Next one. This is, this is Louis, cheesy grin on his face. I cycled past his village just uh, 10, 12 days ago. And uh, Louis, two years ago, was blind. He was a loser because he was a widower. His, his, his kids had sort of abandoned him. He was in the gutter begging. Just a total despairing loser. And in desperation, he came on one of our outreaches, and he was prayed for, and he was healed. Now, the thing is, you can't deny a story, can you? You can come out and meet the whole community that knew, knew Louis the loser. And, and, and what's beautiful is that he's now been completely healed. And, of course, his kids have come to faith seeing that miracle. Last Christmas, the one, we gave him some, some pigs to start up a little business. He's now married, found some wrinkly old babe to get married to. He is a happy chappy. The gospel changes everything. Next one, Francine. This is, again, it's just the modern day Acts of the Apostles. So Francine, she was like the, the lady in the Bible that was, was bleeding, you know, from whatever. And, 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 and desperate, desperate to be healed. And in desperation, she got through the crowd, touched Jesus, and she was healed. Well, that's a modern day version. Francine, her husband had left her because she was bleeding. He couldn't have sex with her. And so he, she came on of our meetings. She was prayed for. She was healed. And she rushed home. She sought out her husband. And said, you're coming back to me, baby. And uh, they are back together. And he's come to faith. Again, the gospel changes everything. Next one. Maybe last chunky story. This is Inosai. You know, he's one of our key young leaders out there. So what we do out there, we just identify, empower, and equip the best local leaders of passion, integrity, gifting, and vision for the transformation of the nation, bottom up and top down. Inosai. Um, loads of his stories. But let me tell one of his stories. And, uh, you know, we've got a photo like that because he's the skinniest rake that I know who's actually healthy. It's because he fasts so much, and he prays so much, and he, he's got a, a ministry of healing. And so there were the two, these two mute ladies who came, you know, couldn't speak, but they were like, could you pray for us? And so he took them around the corner. He just finished a church service. So he left the church, went around the corner. There's there a, there a room there. He took these ladies into the room that everyone in the community knew couldn't speak. 
And he said, Lord, I am so desperate for these girls, these ladies to be released from this bondage. I'm willing to stay in this room for three days, pray. And so that was his determination. He started praying. After 10 minutes, they started speaking. They started weeping. And he took the girls around the corner. It just happened that the church choir were practicing. And so he interrupted the church choir. He said, hey, guys, I've got you two new singers. And they were like, that is a sick joke. And then so he said to the girls, you got anything to say? No! And the, and, and the guys fell to their knees. And people were weeping, seeing the power of God. You know, I hope that just challenges our worldview and our, our sort of Belief or unbelief, in a sense, because there's loads of those stories that I've got and I haven't got time for, and that's not the agenda tonight, but it is good to stir faith, isn't it? Next one, last couple. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to follow us, that's there, but go on again. And uh, I just think we need good news. Uh, so that's, that's a podcast which I'd love you to get hold of. Listen, wherever I go, I say to people... Um, we're not after your money. We're not on a recruiting drive, but I would love you to pray. I'm still alive because people pray. So uh, this is going to wend its way around now. Ollie, do you want to give those? This is Ollie, who used to live with us, who's a, a lovely fella. A lot of you know Ollie Porter. It's great for him to, it's gr- it's great for him to live with us. Sm- smelly feet, but apart from that, all good. And uh, listen, so if you want to stick your emails down there, do pass it on. If you get too many emails, don't. But you will get these stories on a regular basis, and they stir faith. So pass it on if you don't want to. If you do, great. Okay, so I hope that I've already linked in with last week's talk. Is it boring? It's not boring. If you're all in, in different cultures, different contexts. So I, 25 years ago, I'm 49, 25 years ago, I said, God, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I was in a good job. I was like most of us here, I think. Most of us would recognize that we're quite privileged. And that's all relative anyway, but, but um, I knew I'd, I'd gone to the top school, gone to the top university, and I was on that conveyor belt of success and wealth, but I prayed this prayer, and you guys, I want you to pray this prayer, no matter what life stage we're at uh, right now. God, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere. And this guy tracked me down in the city in London. I'd never met, never met this bloke before, and he starts saying, I believe God sent me to you. And he wants you to go to Burundi and be involved in youth and mission and evangelism. My heart's thumping in my chest saying, God, is this, is this you? So I said to him, thanks, weirdo. I'll think about it. I'll pray about it. I'll, I'll be spiritual about it. I went back to my job. I'm in front of the computer. I said, God, right now, in front of the computer, if that wasn't some nut job, if that was you, give me a radical sign right now in front of the computer. It would mean leaving family, friends, security, career, everything, going to a place where I might get killed. And people did try to kill me. It's not boring following Jesus. So give me a radical sign right now. And the phone rang, picked it up. And the voice on the other end, out of the blue, said, do you know anyone who wants to work in Burundi? What do you do with that? And in response to that prayer, I've seen hundreds of thousands of lives impacted. That's an incredible thing to say. And it's not to big myself up because I know the fickleness of my own heart, but God is amazing. And it's not boring and it's not irrelevant. So let's look at relevance right now. What's it look like to be a relevant body? And, and I love it again that Woody's, that you, you are, you know, you're called on by the city to, to solve issues, to engage your respected voice, but there's loads of passengers here. There's plenty of you that are freeloaders, that are not engaged, that are not bringing your gifts to the table to be used. And I want to be part of seeing you drawn in by feeling the calling of the Spirit to say, look, come on. We want to maximize our lives. We don't want to waste time. That's one of the gifts Bruni gave me. I thought I'd die. And if you think you're going to die next week, you're not going to waste today. And you're going to get excited about what matters and what lasts. So anyway, Matthew 9. Verses 35 to 38, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So we've had the introduction, set the scene. Now let's, let's look. And I want, to, I want to talk about, you know, being a relevant body, a new relevant, whatever sphere of influence you have, a relevant witness, and it's going to involve the cost of compassion. So let me start with a story, and this is a true story. Uh, you might want to just shut your eyes to engage with it at the deepest level. Don't be distracted, but this is how it goes. And it's, it's, a, it's a horrible story. And it's a true story. So Eleanor was 28 when the factory where she worked closed down. Unemployed and desperate for money, she answered an advertisement in a local newspaper for au pair work in Bristol. She met with her recruiter, who helped her fill in some forms, and told her that a visa would be arranged for her. 
She was also asked to pay a 700 euro deposit up front before traveling, which she did with support of her family. Eleanor, who believed she was traveling legally, handed her passport over to her Moldova trafficker at the start of the journey, and together they traveled overland by car, coach, and plane uh, to the UK via Prague, Spain, Germany, France, and Dublin. And she realized that she was traveling illegally when the traffickers gave her an Italian passport to use between France and Spain. When she arrived in Bristol, she was told that she owed her traffickers 20,000 pounds in travel costs and that she would have to work as a prostitute to pay them back. She was taken to a brothel where she spent four months working seven days a week, having sex with up to 20 men a day in three different flats. She was allowed 15 pounds a day for food, cigarettes, and condoms. So she had to choose between her health and her sanity. And she was told that she would pay off her debt much more quickly if she gave special services, including having sex without a condom. She was locked in and only allowed out for work and was permitted no contact with other women. Eleanor was too afraid to say anything about her situation to the men who had sex with her, or even to the police who visited the flat ones, as her traffickers had threatened to harm her family if she did. Eventually, she managed to escape by jumping out of a second floor window after being locked in a flat alone all day. Eleanor now, Eleanor now suffers constant back pain from the injuries she sustained during her escape and is afraid to go out alone. Now, did you cry or did any tears come to your eyes as you listened to that story? You know, I wept when I first read that story. I've got a wife, I've got a daughter, I've got a mother, I've got three sisters, I've got friends. By God's grace, it's not you, precious ladies, here this evening. And I hope, I hope, the danger is, is that we've heard too many of these stories and we've hardened our hearts, maybe we could protect our hearts, but I hope you were moved. I hope so. Maybe you wanted to cry, maybe you couldn't cry. I think for us blokes... Particularly, maybe crying's a bit harder. I've wept loads of tears in Burundi. Key survival mechanism. In fact, in Burundi, there's even a proverb for us, for us men. It says, Amasuzi yumurudni achatemba munda. A Burundian man's tears fall in his stomach. He's not allowed to cry, which makes us even more screwed up. So, the first thing I want to say in terms of being relevant and the cost of compassion is that it involves tears. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. We need to be a people of compassion. You, please, engage your heart. Soften it. Guard it on some levels, but be open to feeling the pain of the world. There's so much pain, and sometimes it's overwhelming, but, but God wants to use you. And So I'm caught, it's a, the cost of compassion. Now, what is compassion? The dictionary defines compassion as a deep awareness of the suffering of another coupled with the wish to relieve it. The word compassion comes from the Latin compati, which means to suffer with. And so I come from a place of, of many tears. You know, yeah, my, my old best buddy, Freddie, he wrote to me, a while back when I left Brunei, he said, Simon, please don't stop shedding tears for us Brunians because we've got no tears left to cry for ourselves. And you know, and I've had the choice, and you've got the choice, uh, before God, either of hardening our hearts and settling for cynicism and giving up hope of making a difference, or according to our definition, of embracing a deep awareness of the suffering of others coupled with a wish to relieve it to suffer with. In Bible speak, we're invited to share in the fellowship of his sufferings, which is Philippians 3.11, or, or uh, Romans 8. We, we co-heirs with Christ, which sounds great. Hyphen. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So yeah, it makes me weep to think of so many thousands of women who've been mutilated sexually. I don't go into the details. 
uh, across the lake from me in Congo as a tool of war to, dis to discourage the men. It makes me weep to think of a precious little boy I held in my arms. He was uh, eight years old, but he was the size of a three-year-old because when he was three, he saw his mum and daddy hacked to death and he was forced to eat parts of his dad's body and that trauma stopped him from growing. I mean, that's, I mean the good part of that story is that age eight, he, he heard Jesus say, you must forgive those. Well, if you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. And so eight, he'd stopped growing when he was three. He was eight years old. He's still piddly. And so in response to Jesus saying, you must forgive, he forgave those sickos. And literally, when he forgave, he started growing again. That's mind-blowing, isn't it? There's so much brokenness that it makes, it makes, you, you, it makes me weep. And, and I suppose the invitation is a costly invitation to this evening. It's not a recruitment drive for Burundi. It's because you've got thousands of Eleanors in Bristol right now probably even on your street. So it's just engaging with where he's put you. Lord, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere. And you are where you are right now, hopefully for a reason. And in John eleven thirty five, 35, we read of Jesus' reaction when one of his best mates died. As you know, it's the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. So maybe we need to pray, Lord, forgive me for looking at the world with dry eyes. One of the most moving incidents in my life. It was, it was ages ago now, but I went to Brazil. I went to work with the street kids out there, and I, I was only there three weeks. I think we'd been billed this trip that we're going to save seven million three kids in three weeks. It wasn't going to happen, was it? But, but um, you know, these street kids aren't, aren't cute little kids. You know, they've been buggered and sexually abused, all sorts since day, day one, and so they're tough, and they've been forced to be tough to survive. And our first encounter with these street kids in the heart of Sao Paulo, we went there and we basically essentially got mugged and we had to run, needed police protection, glass bottles shattering on the floor. They threw them at us. There was a guy there, there was a policeman there with a gun to shoot them because they were regarded as vermin, essentially. That was my first encounter. It was the most scared time of my life. I mean, I've been involved with so much more dangerous stuff in Burundi, but fear is often when you don't know what's going on. And that evening, we went back in, uh, to our ward compound, and we were sat around in a group processing that traumatic experience. And, and I wept. And as I wept, the team leader uh, came alongside me. He put his arm around me sensitively, and he said uh, one of the most powerful things I've ever heard in my life. He said, pity cries. I was crying. Pity cries and then goes away. But compassion stays. I needed to hear that. You need to hear that. Pity cries and then switches channel and watches Match of the Day or Emmerdale Farm or whatever it is because we can get our head around that. But compassion stays. And may we be a people. And again, at Woody's, I know there's stacks of people who are here to stay. It could be a geographical, it could just be a state of, of mind that we are engaged. We're going to get our hands dirty. We're not going to be freeloaders and passengers just cruising along, recipient, you know, sort of consumers being fed and just become spiritually bloated. No, we're going to get our hands dirty. And I know I'm privileged. And with privilege comes, I don't feel bad about that at all. What a privilege to be privileged. But with privilege comes responsibility. And Jesus said it, didn't he? In Luke 12, 48, it says, to those who've been given much, much will be required. And so it's not just our tears. The next one will be our talents. So the cost of compassion. If we're going to be relevant as, as a church and as individuals, it, it, will, it will take our tears and it will take our talents. And I hope that you believe, I hope you believe that it's not by accident. You, weigh, you, you are where you are. You're doing what you're doing. I hope you have a sense of calling. If you don't yet have a sense of calling, have one in the next 20 minutes. And we all have different talents. We all work in different spheres. We can all make a difference. In 1787, William Wilberforce, he told the House of Commons, I quote, so enormous, so dreadful, so irremedial is the slave trade's wickedness that my own mind is completely made up for abolition. Let the consequences be what they may, I, from this time, determined I will never rest until I have effected its abolition. Now, historian G.M. Trevelyan said that he described that as one of the turning points in the history of the world. You see, the abolition, the legal abolition of slavery was, uh, was achieved in the face of immense odds. And, you know, you look at Wilberforce, by, by all accounts, he was an ugly mug. He, was, he, had a, he had a weak constitution. He was of the despised evangelicals or enthusiasts, a real minority. The practice of slavery was almost universally accepted and integral to our economy to be Great Britain. And for opposition, he was against huge sort of vested uh, mercantile and colonial interests. And, and, and you know, national heroes like Admiral Lord, Wilson, uh, Lord Nelson and most of the royal family. The guy was vilified. He was slandered. He was physically assaulted. But he persevered for 50 
odd years before he accomplished his goal. Now listen, the point I want to make is that Wilberforce nearly missed his calling. Because when he had an experience of Jesus and grace, age 25, he thought, all right, if I'm really serious about my faith, I need to join the church. Because spiritual matters are more important than secular ones. That is a false dichotomy. Let's completely get rid of that from the get-go right now. Thankfully, John Newton, who was, had been a slave trader himself, who wrote Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, uh, Wilberforce sought out John Newton's counsel and brilliantly, Newton said this to him, no, 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 I don't, don't join the church. He said, it is hoped and believed that the Lord has raised you up for the good of the nation, fighting for the abolition of slavery. It's almost echoes of uh, Queen Esther, isn't it? More do I. For who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And after much prayer and thought, Wilberforce agreed that his calling was to champion the liberty of the oppressed as a parliamentarian. And he wrote in his journal in 1788, my walk is a public one, my business is in the world, and I must mix, mix in the assemblies of men or quit the post which providence seems to have assigned me. Os Guinness said that calling is the truth that God calls us to himself so decisively that Everything we are, everything we do, everything we have is invested with a special devotion and dynamism lived out as a response to his summons and service. <sighs> That's not boring. That is very relevant. So could it be you this evening sense a real validation to pursue your dreams in the political arena or in the arts or in media? or in education, or in the NHS, or, you know, the, the list goes on. Everything is pretty much open for the call of God. Think about your life more in the sense, in the sense of vocation than career. And so a relevant church filled with people engaged in culture and society, seeking to have a lasting impact in Bristol, involves bringing him your talents. So we've had tears, talents, time. Next one, time. Actually, um, uh, Wilberforce, obviously, demonstrated all those, didn't he? Certainly took him a lot of time. Decades of dogged perseverance and determination. And he held a minority opinion and perspective when he started. But listen. Listen. Majorities don't normally change things. Creative minorities do. And the majority just ends up going along. So as anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. In the Second World War, the confessing church in Germany, you know, most, most guys just want to save their skin. They just went along with a Nazi agenda. They endorsed it. They disowned the authentic Christ. And Martin Neumüller, he actually went to prison for it, spent seven years in a concentration camp. He was the leader of the German Confessing Church. He, he wrote this. First, they came for the communists. And I didn't speak out for the communists because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out for the socialists because I wasn't a socialist. And then they came for the labor leaders, and I didn't speak out for the labor leaders because I wasn't a labor leader. And then they came for the Jews. And I didn't speak up for the Jews because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak up for me. That famous Edmund Burke quote, all that it takes for evil to prosper is for good people to do nothing. And, you know, feel free to come and punch me in the face and be offended tonight. But if you're a good person doing nothing, I was going to use a rude word there, let's get off our backsides. Let's get our hands dirty. You've only got one shot at life. Surely you don't want to get to the end of your life. And you sat there in a recliner with a shriveled soul and loads of stuff. I think I just missed it. I played it safe. Come on. There's a picture coming out right now uh, of, uh, of uh, me on a beach with a little black boy. His name's Bongani. Um, 
The other guy there, the bigger guy on the other side of me, I actually met him on the back of a donkey in the Egyptian desert. And we were trotting along. And I said, something familiar about his blue eyes. I said, did you do all your schooling in South Africa? He said, yes, apart from three years of the prep school in Buckinghamshire. He was my tennis partner when we were 11 years old. And uh, that meeting was part of the journey. It changed his life. Because he, he, he came with us back, to, he changed his holiday plans, came to Cairo with us, um, did, end up, came to church, ended up doing an alpha course at HTB, and left merchant banking in the city to start off a project called Starfish. Now, some of you know the Starfish story. There's been a storm, and loads of starfish have been washed up on the shore, and a star, starfish out of water is going to die. So you've got this little boy in his youthful zeal, and he's wandering along, and one at a time, he's wanging back in these starfish, but there's shed loads, hundreds, maybe thousands of them, and it, so he's not making much of a dent, if you like. And at one stage, this older guy comes up to him and says, hey, little boy, stop. Listen, look, there are so many. Give up. You're wasting your time. What difference can you make? And the little boy listened respectfully. Then he bent over and he picked another one up. And he said, well, it made a difference for that one, didn't it? And that's so simple, but so powerful. So I was down preaching in South Africa, and Bongani, you know, he'd buried his own mummy and daddy. He'd inherited the HIV virus uh, from birth. And Anthony, we had a break in my preaching schedule, and he said, I want you to meet this little boy, and, and we're going to give him his dream. His dream is to see the sea before he dies. That's not a big dream, is it? And so we drove six hours down from Johannesburg to Durban, that... Uh, that was, that was actually Durban Beach. Little Bongani, he wasn't actually much fun to be with those three days because he, he was dying. And so he's in pain. But when he saw the sea, his eyes lit up. So that was his dream. Not a big dream. And, and, and then we were, yeah, we put on the swimming togs and paddled into the water. And then this great big crashing wave came and he was bricking himself. So we got back out again. But we, you know, we gave him his dream. And then we were driving back at night to Johannesburg. And it was cold, it was, it was dark, and I was in the back of the truck, two guys in the front, I was in the back next to Bongani, and he actually, he snuggled up in the cold. And he lay his, his, um, his head in my neck. I was listening to this boy, so the husky lungs, and snotty nose, just listening to him. He wasn't dying on me. He was dying. And, um, and Anthony has sort of flummoxed me the question, what's God's purpose in Bongani's life? And he's dead now, but in the retelling of his story, if you get it this evening, what difference can we make? You know, I've, I've, seen, I've seen hundreds of thousands of starfish being shot back. It's not about the numbers game, it's about being faithful to the call of God on your life. But some of you, you're ignoring that call. Some of you, you're diluting that call. You're settling for less. You're genuinely thinking it's worth giving your all to just making more money for someone else than being all in. There's nothing wrong with making money, but if you're going to make loads of money, use it for the kingdom. It could be a very good gift you've got. What difference can we make? Last T. I mean, it was said of Dorothy Day, who was a wonderful lady, who served the Lord. When she, when she died, she loved the truth enough to live it. I love that line. Do you love the truth enough to live it? Tears, talent, time, last one, treasure. And I know we're running out of time, so I'll try to keep this briefly. He says, I want you, I want, I, yeah, I, I want your money. I want it to hit there. And, 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 and you know that the early church was so instructive in that way. Um, you could look at Acts 2 or Acts chapter 4. Let me just look at Acts chapter 4. And almost, you know, every single word almost could be unpacked. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. And what followed, 33 and 34, with great dynamis, with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and much grace was on them all. There were no needy people among them. I meet quite a few, and I work with quite a few people that are willing to live that out in the suffering church, 
very few of us in the West. Now, that's not to feel guilty. It's, it's harder. What we need to do is that hopefully you're resonating deep, calling to deep this evening. I think, bring on. This is, this, is a, this is a challenge, but, and I can't do this on my own, but I could do it if we got together and agreed on things. And it's not salvation by works, it's, it, but, it, but it's not a cheapened grace. It's saying together, let's, let's, what does it look like to actually be a disciple of Jesus? And I love it that, you know, God clearly in that context was very liberal with, with his grace. But was, he, was, was there a correlation between the liberality of God with his grace because they were so liberal with their lives and with their possessions? Right? You know, my experience is that poor people are the most generous people. Repeatedly. And throughout the, the centuries where Christians got it right, they lived out what they preached. They didn't talk a good game. And in turn, people observed that their words were consistent with their deeds. You know, back in the days of Christianity exploding throughout the Roman Empire, uh, you had the emperor at the time, Hadrian. He asked one of his advisors, Aristides, he said, just exactly who are these Christians? And although Aristides wasn't himself a follower of Jesus, he gave them the following summary. He said, they love one another. They, they never fail to help widows. They save orphans from those who would hurt them. If they have something, they give freely to the one who has nothing. If they see a stranger, they take him home and they're happy as if he's a real brother. What a brilliant testimony of the followers of Jesus in Aristides' day. Could that be the testimony of us nowadays, you guys at Woody's? Often it's not our testimony. There was a grubby little street kid, and he was a follower of Jesus. And, and, uh, and we, you know, we do loads of stuff with street kids and see some beautiful trophies of grace. And this little kid was, was actually being bullied and mocked by another boy because he was in really bad straits. And that, the, the boy mocking him said, ha, so you say that God loves you? Well, if that's the case, why doesn't he look after you? Why doesn't God send someone, tell someone to, to bring you shoes and, and a warm coat and better food? And the little grubby urchin, he thought for a moment. And then with tears starting in his eyes, he says, I guess God does tell someone. But someone forgets. Well, I am not going to forget please likewise and again in Bristol you know the church has been the agency that local government has turned to about some of the key you know well well well-being issues uh, in the city which is great in terms of food poverty and welcome of, of refugees and vulnerable children and youth and and homelessness etc and why has that relationship developed? Because folks like, like you have, have got involved. Now, do you know what Wood, Woody's is even involved in? There's so much. I'm not going to list it all. There's loads of stuff. And you could get involved. This is a call for you to get involved. What, what key charities or ministries uh, are you involved in supporting? Or maybe none at all. Well, let's get stuck in. Let's do it together. It's so much fun doing it together. And then other questions to wrestle over. What areas should the church be seeking to speak up into or bring its influence that are currently being missed or neglected? What might we need to change in our thinking or practice to come alongside people in, in need in our society? Because it's actually quite easy to live in a bubble, isn't it? Let me come into land. It was in an African village, there was a fire, and um, the screams of the family caught inside being burnt. And they all got burnt alive, apart from, at the last minute, someone reached in one of the windows and plucked out the baby boy. And the next day, amidst the smoldering embers of that house, the, the village gathered around to discuss what to do with that baby boy. There's actually quite a heated argument because according to the worldview of those guys, there was obviously something very special about this baby boy, Baraka, to be had, blessing to be had because the ancestral spirits had protected him. And so the chief of the village said, well, I'm the chief, so I'm going to have him. But the richest man said, well, hang on, I can afford to give him the best education. Let me have him. The witch doctor said, eh, look, he's got serious psychic power which you could allow me to nurture. 
the, the, the neighbor said, oh, well, hang on, his father had an unpaid debt to me, and I'll take the baby boy in lieu of that payment. And then a sort of random, insignificant, nobody, anybody person just stood forward, but quite authoritatively said, no, the boy is mine. And everyone looked at him, incredulous, like, who are you? And he didn't have to say much. He just opened his hands. And his hands were blistered and burnt and charred. And he said, the boy is mine because I saved him. And Jesus this evening says, you, you are mine. I claim you because I saved you. His hands aren't blistered, burnt, child. What are they? Pierced. How far is too far? When Jesus went that far. You're his. You're bought at a, at a price. Incredible price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So how does that relate to our cynical world? You know, cynicism comes out of despair, but the antidote to cynicism is not optimism, but action. And action is finally born out of hope, and the hope we have is in Jesus Christ, whose scarred hands reach out to embrace us, to comfort us, to heal us, to then draw us along with him, beckoning us, or even pushing us out into the world to be relevant, to embrace the cost of compassion. And I hope as I'm sharing with you, resonating with some of you, like, well, that's pretty costly, that's pretty radical, and it is costly, and it is radical, but there's no other life that's worth living. And he wants to use you. And so it's the chance to put a marker in the ground this evening. So in this talk, I've been teeing you up, literally, to embrace the cost of compassion, the cost of relevance in, 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 in its active engagement. And please don't think you can't make a difference. Please don't disqualify yourself from past mistakes you've made, even recent ones. Please choose to offer up to God your, your tears, your talent, your time, and your treasure. And I'll do it in Bristol, now living in Bath. You do it, sorry, I'll do it in Burundi or, 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 or Bath. You guys do it in, in Bristol. What's it going to look like for you? You've got what it takes to be who he's called you to be. We are the ones God is waiting for. Please stand. All right, this is holy ground right now. So to the worship group, do you want to come up? This is holy ground. Well, you don't have to do this, but uh, I, I like doing it as a position of surrender. I, I open my, the palms of my hands. It's, it's, and I look at the palms of my hands, and they're empty right now. It's a position of humility, of surrender, of saying, I haven't got it all together. Um, it was St. Augustine years ago who said, God gives where he finds empty hands and some of us our hands are so stuffed full it's hard for us to receive why don't you just shut your eyes or look at your hands in that position of humility we're coming to you right now come holy spirit we just say you are so welcome you were here way before we got here you've always been here but in a very experiential real tangible focused way we want to say right now we want to meet with you we've heard words from your scriptures it's been challenging and Lord, you're, you're inviting us to a, into an incredible journey, an unbelievable adventure. It's so not boring. It's so not irrelevant. It's so not hypocritical. And Lord, would all of us choose life this evening? Would we all choose to be a relevant witness embracing the cost of compassion? So we're inviting you right now, Lord God. Meet with us. We say this is holy ground. Would you come and meet with us?
expressing it. And as we have a response in sung worship, it's a chance to engage with God. So press on in and meet with him. And I know there's some significant heart surgery. There's some significant stuff. Some of you have just been checking out things and, and you're just, there's, a, there's a warmth, there's a in your spirit. It's like, this is what I've been waiting for. This is what I was made for. Maybe you understand grace as opposed to religion for the first time, that Jesus reached down and picks you up, cleans you off, takes you up on him, and he looks at you so the old is gone, the new has come. It's a fresh start from here on in, a whole new life. Some of us, it's a recommitment. Some of us, we've lived checked out. We've been cynical. We've given up. Some of us, we're living in serious compromise. We know that we're making bad choices. Could be in the area of finances or relationships, or we're, you know, just just watch feeding our souls absolute. And you say, Come on, I want a pure vessel. Some of us, we've had dash dreams, we've discouraged, we've given up on believing we can change the world. One by one, you can make a difference. He's waiting for you this evening. So let's let's press on in now and, and, and respond.